Welcome to the Stop Ruining My Childhood podcast. A sometimes nostalgic, sometimes cynical look back at pop culture. Join us as we revisit movies, cartoons, and live action TV of the 80s and 90s and ask the question... Does this hold up? Or you know what, Megan? Did I just ruin my childhood? We'll have to see today. Because we are reviewing the beloved classic Christmas movie... Scrooged. (laughs) Scrooged. I'm Steve... I'm Megan. Megan forgot to introduce us. Sorry. Uh, I have a little bit of a cold today, so I apologize for my voice, but it isn't COVID, and we did record this podcast when we had COVID, so I feel like no excuses. No excuses. Get your act together, Megan. You don't get a day off, Megan. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, we have to uh, record even though I have a cold because... This is our 49th episode, and next week marks our 50th episode extravaganza. We have a really fun game. We have uh, lots of excitement and uh, what I believe is going to be a meal instead of a snack. Yes, and we're giving out our first annual Remy's. Yes, the Reminiscent Awards. Uh, So we're going to have some fun categories, some unexpected categories, and... The stakes are pretty high, you guys, because we're going to, uh, once we have our showdown with Steve and Megan and Megan's brother, Tim, uh, Steve and I are going to review some of the winners or losers, depending on the category. Yep. Those that, those movies, TV shows, or cartoons that win a Remy will be automatically thrown into our season two lineup. Yes, exactly. So we're super excited, and uh, that's coming up. And before we get even into Scrooge, goody goody gumdrop, Steve, because our unsponsored snack today is our unsponsored snack today is dots. Dots, which are basically like mini gumdrops, I guess. So there's some controversy about that. Okay, well you tell me about it. I'm gonna try them. All right, so. Gumdrops are thought to have been invented around 1801. And they have an interesting history because they were most famous at that point for being spice drops. So sometimes they were flavored with fruit flavors like we think of gumdrops today. Mm -hmm. But other times they had spices in them. So we're doing this for our Christmas episode because they were really popular at Christmas. Allspice, clove... Um, wintergreen, right? All those kind of like spicy flavors, but spicy in the way that you think of like Christmas, not Mm -hmm. like tacos in the summer. Right. Yeah. And they also had fruit flavored ones. And for hundreds of years, they've been used to decorate gingerbread houses at Christmas time. So what's interesting is that then even though they were invented around 1801, we've talked about other kind of gummy candy being around at that point too yeah but um they didn't get the name gumdrops until around 1859 interesting what did they call them before that i think sometimes they called them spice drops but sometimes they were just like gummies fruit gummy or whatever okay i don't know but they called them gumdrops around 1859 so just around the time of the civil war and then the dots company was originally called Mason Dots, and we're jumping way ahead here because they were done in 1945. Oh, okay. So gumdrops were around for a long time before Dots. Yeah, a really long time. Okay. And the Mason Company um, trademarked Dots in 1972, so they had them for almost 30 years before they trademarked them, which I also find funny. Mm -hmm. And then right after trademarking them, sold them to Tootsie Roll. Okay. So my assumption is only... That Tootsie Roll was maybe going to put out something similar or approached them. And they were like, if we trademark this, maybe we can get more money out of Tootsie Roll. Oh, yeah, probably, yeah. But it's fascinating to me because we've seen this again and again and again in our candy history. That we have these candies that we think of as new, but they're really from like the 1800s. Right. When people were starting to process sugar in different ways and sugar was more readily available after colonial times. Mm -hmm. And then around... World War II, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, so before, you know, before World War II, but in between World War I and World War II, a lot of these small candy companies get started, 
And then between the 60s and the 80s, they get sold to a big conglomerate candy company. Yeah. And then around 2015, 2020, that bigger conglomerate gets sold to an even bigger conglomerate. That's so, true. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of sad in a way because a lot of these candy companies were like one trick ponies. Where the this is the thing that this company put out. They were yeah. Mason Dots, and that's all they put out. Um, so here's the controversy. Okay, hit me. Tootsie Roll claims that this is the number one best selling gumdrop in America. Okay. They've claimed that it's been that way since 1945, even before they took it over. Okay. Many people say that these are not gumdrops at all because a true traditional gumdrop, a little bit gummier, and it usually has sugar on the it outside. It has sugar on the outside. Yeah. yeah. And these and don't. And these don't. They're very smooth. It's like a gusher, but without also, the gush. Also, as I mentioned to you before the podcast started, I have a hard time believing these were the number one best-selling gumdrops in the United States because I've never eaten these before in my entire life. I, that surprises me. Because they're a movie theater candy. And it did, they're, they're really, in my opinion, they're a Christmas candy because I'll, I don't think they're being eaten as much as they're being used for decoration. But you know me at, at, at movie theaters, and what do I get? Reese's Pieces. Skittles, man. <laughs> the only thing that rakes a five <laughs> on our true. snack meter <laughs> for Skittles. Steve. These are these these have a good flavor, but they're very um, chewed. Like they're overly chewy. I don't know if that's we have a little mini Halloween box that I stole from a kid, from a kid's candy. I'm contem- To be fair, the kid did not want these from Halloween. Candy. I'm contemplative on dots. Okay. And this is why I tried one, and it was I think it was the orange, and it tasted a little chemically to yeah. me. Yeah. And it, t- it actually tasted probably the same with the actual, like, texture of it. Reminded me of, like, fruit slices. You know, like, yes. the fake orange candies. Yeah, I don't like those. And I don't care for those that much. I don't like that there's no sugar on the outside. Mm. But then I tried a green one, and I liked that. Interesting. It's lime. Mm-hmm. And it's, like, strong lime. Like, it punches you in your mouth. Yeah, and I liked That's that. That's probably the chemicals. <laughs> But to me, it tasted less chemical. Sorry. It reminded me of lime skittle. Oh, okay. And I like that. Yeah. All right. But they are small. Um, I don't like that there's not sugar on the outside. And they're chewier even than traditional gumdrops, I feel like. Yeah, they like, are. Like, these really, I had to pull, I, like, had to scrape these off my teeth. Again, I think I that's... I don't care for that. Again, I think that's why people use them to decorate gingerbread houses. Because gingerbread... Gingerbread houses are usually decorative, right? They're meant to be looked at. Yeah. We The last time I bought dots was when we were making gingerbread houses. Yeah, they could be like lights or something. I could get that as long as you're not yeah. eating them. But so I'm going to give them a two. All right. I think I'm going to go with a three. I kind of liked them for a fruit candy. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was enjoyable. So. Yeah. Two, two and, and a half, half ghosts. ghosts. We didn't decide that. We didn't decide that. That was, a, that was like, right away. We just spontaneously decided that. All right. So, if you haven't been with us before, we do one out of five for our snack and one out of ten for for the movie, cartoon, or TV show. So, today we're doing ghosts, and let's get into Scrooged. We're going to talk a little bit about the history and some fun facts. Yep. Then we'll take our break. And during our break, we have some interesting updates for you guys, so be sure to stay tuned for that. When we come back, we'll talk about our memories, and then we'll get into our full review and recap. You should be trained not to be turning that podcast dial anyway. Yeah. But really pay attention today. (laughs) Really pay attention today. All right. So, this movie was written by two guys who had been writers for Saturday Night Live. Michael O'Donoghue who was the first head writer for SNL, and Mitch Glazer, who also worked at SNL around that time. And for people who don't know, Bill Murray, um, he was in the National Lampoon with Gilda Radner Mm -hmm. and John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, and they all booked Saturday Night Live, and he took a different show, which was called Saturday Night Live with Howard Cosell. That show was canceled fairly quickly, like after its first season. But at the same time, 
Chevy Chase was, wanted to leave SNL after the first year because right. he was starting to get a ton of movies and stuff. And Lauren Michaels tried to talk him into staying. Um, he was like, just if even if you do a couple more years, you'll kind of solidify yourself. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no. <laughs> so he made a deal that he would come back to host a certain number of episodes. And he was the first not ready for primetime player to leave. And Billy, Bill Murray came in basically to take his place. And many people said he was much more pleasant. Okay. Who's who's to say? Who's to say? So, um, basically, what happened with Bill Murray, you know, if you think about, what are some of the early Bill Murray movies you kind of remember? Caddyshack. Mm-hmm. Ghostbusters. Yeah. Stripes. Mm-hmm. All those movies are ensemble pieces. Right. And so was SNL. So what happened, he did Ghostbusters in 1984. Then he did this movie called The Razor's Edge, which was a remake of a 1946 movie, which was also based on a book. It's like very cerebral. He, um, if you watch, if you don't know the story and you watch the trailer, which I did earlier today, Steve, you're like, what the hell is this movie about? <laughs> like, if you've never seen the original. Mm hmm. It's like one man's search for his identity. But it was a really serious role. And he kind of was like trying to be a dramatic actor and yeah. it totally flopped. Like a lot of audience members like it now, but it was a huge failure at the right. box office and, and really critically panned as well. So he kind of took time off from Hollywood, which I didn't realize because he, he did a cameo role in um, Little Shop of Horrors. Mm-hmm. But other than that, he, he really... Yeah, he took about a four-year break. Yeah. And I heard... It, part of it was Razor's Edge, but I heard part of it, too, was Ghostbusters, because Ghostbusters was a huge hit. Yeah. I mean, bigger than, as we mentioned before, Stripes. Mm -hmm. And even Cad Caddyshack has a cult following now, but Ghostbusters was a worldwide hit. Yeah. And he was a little bit taken back by the amount of attention. I would think so, too, because... You're coming out of, like, they got attention from SNL, but they got, like, movie star attention, right? right. Or, like, later on, I would say, like, B-list or maybe C-list movie star. Mm -hmm. Like, you are you were in Caddyshack. You're a young guy. You're kind of an up-and-coming comedian. That's nothing compared to having a likeness of yourself in a cartoon, in an action figure, having kids dress up like you for Halloween. Yes. Like, it was a totally different... It's not just that it was the second highest grossing movie of 84, but it's also, like, the cultural impact that it had. Yeah. So, yeah, so we think it's interesting. So this actually... He was approached with this movie a couple years beforehand, and he turned it down because he wasn't ready. Yeah. And then when he looked at it again, he went to the two writers and he was like, some of the stuff to me doesn't seem to be working. Can we rework it? Right. And because they were alums from SNL and they had all worked together before, um, that's basically what they did. He also ad-libbed a lot. But apparently, you know, if you have you you've read the novella of A Christmas Carol, which Scrooge is based on. Right. Right. The love interest character in the original story, she moves on right and so in the present when he does the ghost of C christmas present um ebenezer scrooge travels to he sees his nephew fred right he sees bob cratchit's house but he also sees bell and basically she's with her family right and he's kind of like this is what i missed out on and there's this scene where she talks about him and how she's kind of glad that she didn't go down that path but she kind of, like, thinks about him sometimes, prays for him, hopes that he's different. Right. And um, and it's kind of like, for him, it was this epic love. And for her, it was like somebody she dated for a couple months and yeah. then moved on from and then had a family. So, basically, the original version of the movie, I think, was much closer to that, where the love interest didn't carry through the whole film. Like, it was more like a blip rather than, like, a major component gotcha so that's one of the things that they reworked now we caught two of his brothers in this steve but there are actually three did you know that yeah there had the yeah, i did read that somewhere that there had actually been three of his 
There was a number of people, but Brian, John, and Joel. Yes. So We saw Brian and John, I think, but we didn't grab yeah. Joel. So Brian Doyle Murray is Bill Murray's older brother, and he's also in Groundhog Day as the mayor. He's hilarious. Yep. Um, and here he plays the father, Earl. Yes, he plays the father in the flashbacks with Christmas Past. Yes. Then we have John Murray, who plays the brother, James. Yes. So in the original Christmas Carol, uh, Scrooge has a sister who passes away giving birth to Fred, just like her mother passed away giving birth to Ebenezer. Um, But John here, John Murray plays James, the brother of our main character. Yes. Then we have Joel, who plays a party guest at James's house when they're doing... Oh, okay. He was one of the other guys. Yeah. Was he the one that you thought looked like George Clooney? No. Okay. No, no, it's this guy. Oh, okay. (laughs) I just showed Steve a picture. Um, Yeah, and it's interesting because he's done roles on things like Mad Men, Dharma and Greg, Still Standing, Shameless, uh, Monsters University. He did some voiceover stuff for that. So it's kind of interesting that they made it like a family affair for this Christmas movie, right? Yep. Um, And we also have... So Bill Murray in part wanted his brothers there, I guess, because he had done, as I said, ensemble stuff other than the razor's edge. He really was worried about carrying a film again. And especially a comedy where most of the people in this are cameos. Like Karen Allen does play the love interest. She's in a number of scenes. She though has also some scenes where it's not really between her and him. Right. Yep. So because there's so many people And many of them are cameos while he's in every scene. He was like, you know, Carol Kane would come in for a couple days and then she'd be gone. And then Karen Allen would come in and she was there for a week or so. And then all of her scenes would be done. And then we'd have, you know, all these other celebrity cameos and all this stuff. So um, the guy who plays Elliot Loudermilk. The Bobcat Goldblum. Bobcat Goldblum. Yeah. yeah. So he he had all these great people, and it has such a good cast. But he really felt like it was a totally different experience for him the way that it was filmed. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Karen Allen. By the way, you know a lot of people know her from Indiana Jones. Yes. And also another John Belushi vehicle, National Lampoon's uh, Animal House. She played Katie in Animal House. And then she kind of didn't seem to do as much, like, especially after this movie. But that's because she had a son. And so she kind of took, she's like a working actress, you know, like she does like, she'll do like a couple projects a year that probably don't take her that long to film. But basically, she kind of made a lot of her money pretty early on with some of these bigger roles. And then just took care of her son. She also, she, Steve, this woman, she's been a singer songwriter. She's written plays. She's directed short films. She did um, a film based on a memoir. She also, in 2003, started her own fiber arts company. Where, like, she knits in, like, a Japanese, uh, traditional Japanese style, from what I understand. It's, yeah, it's just fascinating to me that, like, she's done all of these various different creative things. And I just think that that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, her textile company is Karen Allen Fiber Arts in Massachusetts. And she teaches acting at Bard College. And she runs a farm in Massachusetts. Interesting. So... Um, she, yeah, she got a a degree from FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology, um, for her work in the, in the textile arts. So it's just, yeah, it's kind of interesting what a, what an amazing cast this had. And it didn't do, you know, quite as well as Ghostbusters, even though they tried to use that in the marketing. They're like, Bill Murray's working with ghosts again. Right. Um, but it did it did pretty solidly. It was the 13th highest grossing film of 1988, but you have to remember that it came out in November. Right. So, to me, it's one of those things like it, yeah, this is the thing also. It had a 32 million dollar budget. Yeah. Okay, they paid Bill Murray 6 million of that. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah, and when they when they went to the studio with it, they were like, "That's price." I mean, at this point, that's huge. Yeah. But I mean, you're talking, you know, a fifth of the budget mm-hmm. went to one actor, right? Yeah. And they, but they really pushed it by saying, you know, listen, Bill Murray is a big name, and because he's been not been in anything for four years, every year that he hasn't been in something, his value goes up. Mm. Right, and they they told the studio and they convinced the studio that at this point in 1988, besides Eddie Murphy, Bill Murray was probably the only other actor that could pull in $10 million on opening weekend. Right, yeah, that's interesting. So they knew what they had. Yeah. Um, The other (laughs) other thing, too, it's... um, Oh, I well, I have a couple other fun facts, but I'm going to put them in as we talk about stuff. Sounds good. I think that that's, that'll be good. So here, uh, as I said, we're going to take our break and listen up for our announcement here about some fun upcoming stuff. Steve, I found a bunch of shows on streaming networks that we don't have. That's nice, Megan, but you know, we work on a budget, and I'm still waiting for snack companies to sponsor us. So unless you can find a new way to bring in sponsorship, our choices in viewing are limited. YouTube is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So that's why I set up our page on Patreon. People can help support our show and get exclusive access to content. What about all those bonus episodes we got hanging around? So our old bonus episodes are going to go up. And then we're going to have new bonus episodes about once a month once we start season two. We're also going to put ad-free versions of all our regular episodes as well. And pictures of me spread out on a bearskin rug. No. But we are going to be more interactive. We're going to have a poll every month and people can vote for what episode we should do for that season. So basically we're going to have, we're going to continue with our format of cartoon live TV show and movie. But the fourth week in every month we'll get to be listener's choice from patreon exactly so you the listener are going to help decide what we watch and all this content is available at each level so if you want to support us for just a few dollars we have those our first year it's really affordable and if you'd like to help us pay for what we watch and the snacks we eat you can donate a few dollars more if you're a big spender yeah exactly and listen if you're not comfortable doing patreon at all we're still going to do the regular podcast and you can interact with us on facebook i'm only talking to patreon people oh that's not no that's not true that's not true (laughs) links to subscribe are going to be in the show notes each week and also on our website stop ruining my childhood.com or you could just go to patreon.com forward slash stop ruining my childhood all one word Megan, I don't know what a Patreon is. Oh, no. We're going to have to have a whole other conversation. Okay. (laughs) All right. All right, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Megan. And I'm Steve. I hope you didn't touch that dial and that you heard our special new announcement. But with that being said, we're going to move on to the movie. Yeah. Scrooged. What are your memories of this movie? I saw this movie as a kid, 1988, so I would have been 11, mm-hmm. and it was it was fun. I mean, it was, you know, I probably saw it on, like, HBO. I don't think I went and saw it in the theater, um, but it was fun movie. I liked it a lot. You know, I was a Bill Murray fan because of Ghostbusters and things like that in my childhood. I remember seeing Stripes again. I had HBO very early as a kid. Yeah. So, Stripes was on HBO, you know, Um So I had seen, and I don't know if I'd seen Caddyshack by that point. I did later. But I was a fan. I liked Bill Murray. And this was, this was fun, you know. It's a great modern take, I felt, on the Christmas Carol narrative. Did you watch it more than that as a kid? Like, did you watch it every Christmas? Um, it was not like a tradition, but I feel like, you know, it's on a lot around Christmas time. Yeah, that's true. So I did, I'm, I've seen it multiple, multiple times growing up, but it wasn't something like our family's tradition was to watch Scrooge, mm-hmm. right? Um, we, you know, like I, I told you before, like we didn't even watch, I never watched A Wonderful Life until you and I were married. Yeah, right? don't so tell I was people 40 that. years old before I ever saw that movie. It's upsetting um, to me. <laughs> because we just, we were not, I don't know, we, 
we we did other things. We did games. We didn't watch a lot of TV or movies around Christmas time. But, you know, it was always on TV, so I did see it a lot of times. Um, but, yeah, I, I liked it. I thought it was funny. It's got a lot of visual effects, especially for kids. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting because kids like this movie because of, like, the ghosts and some of the slappy stick slapstick kind of stuff. But at the same time, there's a lot of adult humor in it. And not, like... Not like inappropriate graphic adult humor, but like highbrow adult humor that kids may may yeah, miss. Yeah, I mean, sometimes there's sexual innuendo. But it's but, stuff that kids may not get. Yeah, and I will say that watching it with the intention of doing this podcast mm. and thinking about what I thought as a kid, um, this is one of those movies, so we did watch this every year, pretty much. And there are a handful of movies, this, Back to the Future, Princess Bride, that I pretty much have memorized. And like, yeah. so I really held myself back. And once in a while, I said the lines along with the character. But you know how people do that with Rocky Horror Picture Show? Yes. Yeah. I don't. But I, I know, know people but, do it, yes. But I could basically do that with this movie. Having said that, you're completely correct. Because my my number one thought as I was watching this was... Oh, that's a joke I did not get as a kid. Mm -hmm. That's a joke I did not get as a kid. And a lot of it is Bill Murray improv Right. That, like, and there's a line at the end where they're doing the song, and he says, feed me, Seymour, feed me. And I always thought, that's a weird spot to say that. But he had just been in Little Shop of Horrors doing, right, like, a cameo. And he th they make a joke about Richard Pryor. Yeah. Um, the story that Richard Pryor used to tell was basically that he had been doing drugs and set himself on fire. Yes. And they're in a restaurant and a guy flambays a uh, baked Alaska. Yep. And he starts screaming. He's like, oh, I thought that was Richard Pryor. Yeah. But first of all, it's a very 80s joke. It's a very era specific joke. Yes. Secondly, though, if you're a kid, you have no idea what that reference right. is. There's also, there are cameos here of people that I did not know. I didn't know Bobcat Goldthwait. I didn't know Robert Goulet right. <laughs> as like a Cajun Christmas. Mm -hmm. I didn't know um, Six Million Dollar Man. Lee Majors. I, yeah, yep. I was just a little too young for that. So there, there are a lot of things that it's interesting to me that, and my brother, who will be on our next episode, this is one, this was one of our go-to Christmas movies for the two of us. He's four, year young, four years younger than me. There's no way that he would get most of these references. The whole thing. Right. There's a whole thing about how Bill Murray looks like Richard Burton. I don't even fully get that joke now. Let alone <laughs> as like a nine-year-old. You know what I mean? Um, and I think, I think I did see this in theaters. I think that I saw this at the Palace Theater. Now, I could be wrong. But I remember, I feel like I kind of remember it being on the big screen and watching it in that form. Um, but we definitely had it on VHS um, and then later DVD. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's get into it. Sure, sure. Um, well, it opens up classically because it's, of course, Bill Murray plays Frank Cross, who's a TV exec. Mm -hmm. It opens up with commercials. Yes. For Christmas specials. And I think that this is such a smart way to start because if you're in the theater, you're do they're doing previews. Right, and then it leads into this. And then it leads into this. So yep. yeah, and the it's night, a cold open. The reindeer died. It's hilarious. Santa Claus with machine guns and Lee Majors it's hilarious. fighting ninjas. And even if you don't, again, even if you don't know who Lee Majors is. But see, I did. I'm surprised you didn't because Lee, Na Lee Majors was the $6 million man. I, I wouldn't have watched that That was show. a super popular late 70s, early 80s show. So it surprised me you didn't watch that. And it was like a show big with kids because it was sort of superhero-y. Yeah, but I, it wouldn't have been... You know, and actually I knew him even more. I knew him from that, but then also in the 80s he was in a show called The Fall Guy. Yeah, which I never was saw that either. phenomenal, where he played a stunt man. I've never seen either one of those two shows. Yeah, with Jody Banks, I believe, was in that with him. Um, excellent show as well. So I definitely knew who Louis Majors was, even as a kid. But it was funny seeing him again, and Santa being like, the $6 million man? And I'm like, oh, Lee Majors. Um, that was funny. And then, of course, they switched to Bob Goulet's Cajun Christmas. Which 
always made me laugh, even though I, I don't... I have no reference for Robert Goulet other than this movie. Right. For the most part. And he's singing. He's a crooner, right? Oh, okay. So he's singing and paddling through the, the bayou. Yeah. And, of course, these alligators are kind of trying to eat him a little bit. And he's, like, hitting him with the stick, right? Yeah, that's the thing. If you don't know who he is, it's a funny gag. Right. Right? The, that he's, like, silver belt. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> then it Christmas. switches to the 1950s TV show. And we get Father Loves Beaver. Okay, this is one of my favorite things because it just makes me laugh every time. Well, if I know your father, he's out chasing Beaver again. Yeah, Father Loves Beaver. And it's obviously supposed to be, you know, (laughs) leave it to Beaver. But the way, of course, the play on words and the innuendo involved. Now, would you have understood the innuendo as a kid? No, or did you think it I was thought, like making just, fun of Leave It to Beaver? I thought it was making fun of Leave It to Beaver because she looks exactly right the same as the person from that. Yeah, um, so it's IBC Television, mm-hmm. and then so we pull out to Bill Murray, and he's like, "Run the Scrooge promo." Right. And they do it. It's so bizarre. And it's wait, like... no, wait for the first one. The first one is. A guy sitting in a chair, and it's supposed to be like Masterpiece Theater. Right. Right? That you have a narrator, and they're going to do this live Scrooged production, which has been a thing even recently. Like, they had Grease Live, Mm -hmm. and they had, like, Peter Pan Live. A lot of times those live productions don't go well. No. But this is supposed to be a live production on Christmas Eve to force people to watch TV. Yeah. Um, Because a lot of people, we find out later, don't have VCRs. Mm -hmm. Right? So, what's funny is he was like, he goes, does that ever suck? You got a, the biggest special we've ever put on, starring America's favorite old fart, sitting in a chair, reading a book. Mm. It's so good. It's so good. So, he says, roll mine. Yeah. And it's like, famine, <laughs> pestilence, war, like, like, you better stay in and watch this show this Christmas Eve. Or your life could depend upon it. <laughs> yeah. And it's like the end of the world. It's supposed to be kind of like the world's ending and we're all basically about to burn and we need the Christmas spirit now more than ever. Right. But it's like supposed to scare the crap out of you, basically. Yeah. And he's like, that's how it's done. And of course, the only board member that speaks out against him is... Elliot Loudermilk. Elliot Loudermilk, who's played by Bobcat Goldwaith. Who is a American treasure. And a very distinctive voice. Bobcat Goldwaith is... First off, most people remember him and think of him as... He's a very stereotyped actor, right? Yeah. Because of his voice. Um, he's a character actor, 100%. But he actually has a phenomenal sense of humor. And he has, a, and he's just a really good comedian. Um, by this point, he was well known. Mm-hmm. Right, he had been at this point when Scrooge is released. He had been in all four Police Academy movies. Right, right? Police Academy one, two, three, and four had come out. He was in One Crazy Summer. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, following this now too, he he's been in Bobcat Goldthwait has over like fifty credits to his name. Yeah, he was he's a stand up basically. He's a stand up, but he does a lot of comedy, and because of his voice, he's done a lot of animated voiceover work as well. Yeah, Hercules, I think yep, he's probably Hercules best Hercules he for. was in, yeah. but he's been in a lot of stuff. And he's been in a lot of shows. He, there was one or two, like, B-level movies that he kind of starred in that were sort of like silly kind of comedy movies. Mm-hmm. It was almost like Pauly Shore-ish kind of stuff yeah. where they tried to make him a leading guy, which is just not the he's spot just for really, him. Yeah, he's not. He's but he's a, a hilarious actor. supporting actor. And the his type of comedy really, I feel like, counters Bill Murray's straight man. Yeah, well, because he's supposed to be, as the name implies, like a milk toast kind of guy. Yeah. But he's trying to speak up, and Frank Cross, as his name implies, is very cross and angry. Yeah. And just wants him gone. Which, basically, he 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 gives him whatever, Code 9, and I'll hit louder milk. Yeah, they fire him and throw him and all of his stuff out on the sidewalk in four yeah. minutes and 30 seconds. Yeah. 
That's like ridiculous. That's how they did it back in the eighties. The eighties, they didn't play around with HR. They, they just didn't tossed have, you out. I was out. gonna say they didn't have an HR department back then. This is before people would sue you for wrongful termination or sexual harassment. Um, then we meet his secretary Grace, mm-hmm. who I didn't talk about. You know, Alfre Woodard is an amazing actress. She's won Emmys, Golden Globes, Screen Actors Guild. She was nominated for Grammys. She was nominated for Academy Awards. She's a political activist. She's just had, like, an amazing career. Um, and in and, and a number of things, from Desperate Housewives to Star Trek to Heart and Soul, uh, Primal Fear, it, it, Passion Fish. Just, like, her, she has a varied, a really varied... Um, career Mm -hmm. a lot of people might she was also in um captain america civil war yep and luke cage if if people might know her from that but at any rate she plays his secretary grace and she is the bob cratchit character right Right. from the 19 from the 1943 the employee that he's kind of mistreating and taking advantage of right and he goes through (laughs) they go through the christmas list of all the people he's got to send gifts to and he's like towel Towel, towel, VHS. Yeah. So the higher up people are getting a VCR, basically. Right. A, a VHS video recorder, they're calling it, which I thought was kind of funny. Because mm-hmm. I thought more people had VCRs by this point. But maybe not. I don't know. Um, well, it also might be like a high-end thing. Yeah, that's true. And everybody else is getting a bath towel with, yeah. with IBC logo. Yeah. And, some, and then she's like, my bonus, and he's like, bath towel and she's like really and he's like in a washcloth yeah and he also sends one to his brother james yeah she's like your brother your your only only brother brother. and he's like towel and then he goes give me the list he's like most of these are towels so we we get i think what's nice about this a lot of times adaptations of the christmas carol in my opinion spend way too long on the before part to show you what this character right. is like. I think that it is enough scenes. You get really a flavor for what this mm-hmm. guy is like mm-hmm. before the transformation. Yep. Right? You meet his boss, who's kind of an idiot. Yeah. He's rich, but an idiot. He wants them to do programming for cats and dogs. Well, but let me say this. He's like, let's do a show mm. just featuring cats. <laughs> and then let's call it YouTube. Right. So you're saying he's a visionary. I'm saying he's a great visionary of our time, yeah. Um, But he wants to do programming for dogs and cats, so they're trying to think of ways that they can incorporate something. He's like, what about a detective that dangles string? Right. Because someone told him that they did a survey and that animals are watching the TV. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think that that's... I mean, they do have a channel that's all, like, puppies and kittens. But that's for people to watch, not animals. Well, is it? Because I put Benji on one time for Lulu, and she quite enjoyed it. She did not. She howled at it the whole time, and I had to turn it off. I don't know about that. But it also... We get a little montage. It shows... It shows Bill Murray quickly interacting with Grace, who mm-hmm. he treats poorly, yep. interacting with his brother James, who he treats like garbage. And then also he gets an award for humanitarianism yeah. and then leaves it in the taxi. And like you get a really the, good feeling. The taxi that he steals from an old lady carrying packages. Yes, he steals the taxi yeah. from an old lady. And so it's just you get this idea. And this is part of the brilliance of this movie. And to be honest, why I think Bill Murray was the only person that could play this, Mm -hmm. right? Bill Murray is funny, but at the same time, Bill Murray is very unlikable. Yeah. He can play unlikable. He can play, he plays like the jerk really good. Mm -hmm. And that's Scrooge. Scrooge has to be that way, right? You have to be rooting kind of for the ghosts. But I'm gonna versus I'm, Scrooge. Yeah, I'm gonna put it a different way. Okay. He plays a jerk in a really funny, likable way. Like you enjoy watching his performance. You do. You don't yes, you enjoy him. watching the performance. Yeah. But he he is like you get that he, you're like wow, this guy's really a dirtbag. Yeah. So then we have the actually the first spirit, which is his former boss. Lou. Yeah, the Mar the the ghost of Marley kind of right. You know, trope. Um, I almost this is 
My favorite version of this story is the Muppet Christmas Carol. And every time I talk about it, I always reference the Marley Brothers. And I forget, even though I've read it like, I don't know, maybe 12 times. Mm -hmm. It's just one Marley. (laughs) There's not brothers. They make it brothers so that they can have Stellar and Waldorf in the Muppet version. Yep. Steve, one time I was teaching that book and I was like, so then the part with the Marley brothers and people are like, what are you talking about? Right. Um, so, yeah, he's the Marley character and he had a heart attack on a golf course. So he's dressed in this like very 80s yuppie golf gear, but he's a zombie basically. Right. And he's there, of course, as Marley was for Scrooge to warn Frank that he needs to change his ways and that he was going to be visited by three ghosts. Yeah, and it's interesting. I wish that they had done the part with the chains. Because in the book and in all the other versions, he is he is trying to... It's almost like a purgatory thing. Like, Marley's trying to work off these chains. That They're the chains he forged in life. Link so by link. Every link is something that he he did or mm-hmm. a person that he did a bad deal on or, you know, somebody he ignored or treated poorly. And they're all held together in, in different depictions. They're sometimes held together with like money boxes. Other yeah. ones, other times they have like the ball and chain kind of mm-hmm. effect. But um, and, and then he tells Scrooge that his chains are even longer. Right. He's been he's been alive longer. He's been acting this way for a longer yes. period of time. So um, I think that's a really good visual that we kind of didn't get. But we do get a golf ball coming out of his head. Yeah, with a mouse <laughs> with pushing a mouse. it and a mouse in his skull it's as he's drinking such, like a martini. It's such a good special effect, though, Stephen. It still holds up. It does. Yeah, it really it is. It really well. does. A lot of the effects in this movie are actually really well. They're they're not CGI'd, but they're like they're really well done special effects, almost kind of puppetry in some mm-hmm. aspects, and they do hold up. Yeah. Some of them like that are kind of like practical effects. So, um the ghost ghost dials Claire. So we meet Claire the love interest because yes. he he ghost dialed her and then she so she shows up the next day because she's like you called me and and now we find out why they're not together anymore because he wants all the money and the power in the world and she she's a humanitarian who runs a homeless shelter she run, yeah she looks out yeah. for people and and actually cares about people and that kind of thing um, so it's it's interesting again the eighties touches on this you know the book was written in in. 1840s mm-hmm. when they started to you know they he was trying to write it to show the disparity between the wealthy and the poor and especially you know at that point in time you still had like child labor and stuff yes but the 80s we get a ton of stories like this where there's disparity between the wealthy and the middle class or the wealthy and the the poor we had a bigger population of homeless at this point in time you know because of the changes to the mental health care system and things like Mm -hmm. that so it's interesting that they have claire in this job right um and the rehearsals for scrooge are going on we also have the la slime ball who's trying to take over frank's job yep who Frank kind of is worried about a little bit, Bryce. Um, and Bryce went to school with the big guy's son, the boss's. The boss's son. So, of course, yeah. he's got an in already. Yeah. And, yeah, it, it's it's made fairly – Bryce, it, it's – it's. He's the younger version of Frank, yeah, basically. Yeah, he's played by John Glover, who's been in a lot of things as well. Yeah, he's a great character uh, actor, too. He really is. I remember him mostly as Lex Luthor in Smallville. Mm. But or actually, he played Lex Luthor's dad in Smallville. Um, but yeah, he's been in a lot of different things, and he does a good job here of kind of selling it that he's 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 acting super super friendly, but he's he's after his he's after Frank's job. Yeah, and he's a jerk, but he's a jerk in a different way. Exactly. Finally, we come to the ghost of Christmas Past. In in. You know, what's interesting, too, here is that the ghost of Christmas past, he's told the first ghost is going to come at noon. This is an interesting take on the story because in the original story, all the ghosts come at night. Yes. In the same night. Here, it starts at noon and kind of goes throughout the day until the night when they're actually filming. 
Um, yeah, it's over several days. And and so right. Well, it starts earlier, yes. Yeah, yeah. But the ghosts come all within a day, basically. Yeah. But it's during the day where he's like having these hallucinations or seeing these things. So other people are reacting to him. Yeah. Where in the original, it's just him in his bedroom. Yeah, I liked this change a lot because it added to the comedy quite a bit that like we talked about right before he sees the ghost of Christmas past, he blows off Claire. Uh, doesn't make time for her, won't tell her why he actually called her and left her a, a message on her answering machine. But <clears throat> then we go into this thing the next day, as Steve said, where he's seeing like an eyeball in his whiskey glass. Yes. By the way, these people are drinking at work a lot. That's the 80s, baby. I guess. I mean, because maybe they couldn't show them doing cocaine. I don't know. Or this is just how people in Hollywood think people like worked in New York City. I don't know. Um, but he sees an eyeball. He sees uh, the guy on fire, right? All this stuff. Runs out of the restaurant with this slime ball LA guy and, and his boss and into the taxi cab of the Coast of Christmas Pass. Now, Steve, this is the thing about this movie. You can watch this 10 times and you pick up something different every time. Mm-hmm. They zoom in. They zoom in and he's got... The cab ID that the cabs are required to have. Yeah. And it says, goes to Christmas. Goes to Christmas past, yeah. And it's played by David Johansson. Hot, who, hot, hot. Who, yes, is Buster Poindexter. Oh. He played with the, the punk band, the New York Dolls. He's a, he's a singer. Mm-hmm. Um, he's done some cameos and movies and things, but he, he's a musician. But he does a really good job in this. Um, he's got that very gruff voice, scratchy yeah. voice, and he really sells like the New York '80s cabbie. Yeah, it's interesting, um, and I like how they're they're driving around in circles and stuff. And Bill Murray's like, "Just take me home," and he's like, "You got it." Um, so they come to his childhood home, and just like in the original story, now we we start to feel a little bit of sympathy, right? Yep. Here, his mother's pregnant with James. She's watching. TV pregnant while smoking. Yes. And he's just pretty much plopped in front of the TV. And his dad comes in and throws him a piece of veal for Christmas and tells him he should get a job yeah. if he wants to. His a dad's obviously a butcher. Train. He's got yeah. the apron on still. <laughs> he's like, there you go. And he's like, obviously not thrilled with a piece of meat when you're like a nine year old kid. Yeah. And his dad's like, what's wrong? Like, that's a, that's a, that's a, what do you say, $50 piece of veal or something like that. Yeah. But it's not the choo choo train. And it's and then the mom gets up and leaves. The dad leaves and he's basically there again in front of the TV. So he tries to play it off, but he's quite upset. And one of my favorite one of my favorite pieces of this is he starts having an argument with the ghost. They leave the house and he and the ghost start arguing. And the ghost is like, You never did anything your whole life, Frank. And Frank's like, Yeah, I did. One time I did such and such, and he's like, that was the courtship of Eddie's father. Yeah. Oh, I won the big baseball game. And then he goes, no, there's this other time, though, where there's this girl, and she had pigtails, and I was running down toward her. And the ghost goes, you're such a schmuck. That was the Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. And he goes, was it the homecoming episode of Little House? Yes, it was the homecoming episode of Little House, which is hilarious. Because I've seen the homecoming episode of Little right. House, and that is what happens. It's like her first boyfriend, he runs down a hill to meet yeah. her, and they hug and stuff. Oh my gosh. I was like, I always, I just always laugh at that part so hard. But it's, it's All hilarious. of his memories are TV. Yeah, all of, he's, because TV shaped his whole life, he doesn't remember the fact that he childhood really sucked. All he remembers is what he watched on TV, basically, and it's kind of filled in the blanks. Yeah. We see also then his relationship with Claire. Yeah, we see him meet her. How they met. They met at a... He He's doing work as a mailroom clerk, which is actually what his dad did in real life, um, while everybody else is having a raucous party. Yeah. And we get our first little innuendo, because Tina is a secretary there who's photocopying her butt. And giving it to people as presents. And I was so confused by this as a kid. Like, why would you photocopy her? Because she has a nice little butt. But also, it's I up didn't, under her skirt. But also, I didn't realize 
like photocopier. It's supposed to be like late seventies, right? So photocopier was probably a newer. Oh yeah. But by the time I watched this, it what you know what I'm yeah. saying? So it's just kind of funny. Um, so yeah, so he he meets Claire. They bump heads. They have a little meet cute moment that's like straight out of a romantic comedy. And then it <laughs> jumps to them together, like when their first Christmas is together in an apartment. Yeah, and he she gets him. Uh, a Hindu art of love, which I never caught this line before, but he turns to the ghost and he's like, I didn't really need a sex manual. Yeah, the Kama Sutra. He gets, she gets him a copy of the Kama Sutra. But I, for, I never caught that he turned to the ghost and he's like, I didn't really need a sex manual or anything, yeah. just so you know. And he gets her knives. Yeah. So we can see already. Gensu knives. Those are nice knives. We can see already the differences, yeah. you know, between these two characters. Then it jumps to their breakup. And yeah, it's interesting because it's a, she's really almost like still a child of the 60s where she wants to save the world. Mm-hmm. And he's gone on a different path to become like a a really yuppie, high power guy yeah. who wants to run the world, which they say to each other at one point. Right. She's like, you still trying to, he goes, same Claire, it's still trying to run the, save the world. And she's like, you still trying to run it? Yeah. Um. After he tries to staple antlers to a mouse's head. Yes. <laughs> or implies that they should be. So, yeah, so we see all those things and we see kind of why he is the way he is. That he had a part on a TV show. He got in good with this Lou guy, the boss. Um, he worked his way up to become the the youngest president of the network. And that meant a lot to him. But he had to sacrifice basically everything else. Right. And his heart... Um, And now he's, like, sort of heartless. So you can see how he's kind of touched by this. And then all of a sudden, he and the ghost are in the audience of this Frisbee show. And they're watching him be ridiculous in, like, what is essentially, like, a local, like, Barney, kind of, right? Yeah, it's a children's show, and he's the character. Because that's obviously where he got his start, basically. And the, the ghost is like, you don't know who you are. You don't know where you are. You don't know what's going on. And Bill Murray's like, I know a couple things. I know where I am. I know who I am. And I know what's going on. And then he goes, wait, what's going on? And then he shows up back in the set looking like he's drunk or hallucinating or high. Yeah. Stumbling around. And we get the setup uh, each time for the next ghost. Right. Right. So this time um, he goes to... Does he go to the shelter? Yeah, he goes to see Claire. Yeah. At the shelter she works at. And he's like mumbling to himself and they think that he's homeless and they immediately start taking care of him. Yeah. Which he repays by calling them very big girls, which I did not care for. <laughs> and saying that they're just, they she should fire them. And she goes, they're volunteers. And he goes, because nobody's going to pay them because they're idiots. <laughs> which is kind of a funny line. Mm-hmm. He also, they mistake him for Richard Burton, and he does a Richard Burton impression. But again, I think I've seen a Richard Burton film, like maybe one of the ones with uh, Liz Claiborne, or Liz Taylor, rather. Liz Taylor, yep. But I don't really have a reference. Right. But it's a funny scene. Yeah. Uh, the, the You know, all these are character actors, again, doing bit parts. Right. So the woman um, a lot of people know is Mama Fratelli from Goonies. She was also on Throw Mama from the Train. Yep. Um, and she's there and these two guys. Her- Herman, who's a homeless man, asks him for money. Yeah. And he blows him off. Right. But they also are like, Mr. Burton, Mr. Burton. I just... It's again. It's amazing to me that I found this hilarious as a kid. Because mm. even as an adult, I'm like, I don't really get that that show. Some humor is like so timely, you know. Um, and again, he blows off Claire a second time, and he's like, "You want to save somebody? Save yourself." Yeah, you're wasting your time on these people. Then we have the Ghost of Christmas Present, played by Carol Kane. I always found. This dynamic quite uh, troubling. What did you think of it? Well, Carol Kane plays the Ghost of Christmas present. And she is like a fairy. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. Because she's very loud. 
and very, you know, her voice is loud. And yeah. she's very, like, most of the time you think of fairies, like, hello, little boy. And she's like, she kind of starts that way, but then she's like, ah! you know, and she yeah. yells and she punches him and she hits him. But Carol Kane is phenomenal, right? We know if she was in Taxi, mm-hmm. right? She was in Princess Bride. Yep. yep. Right? But is it weird that I think Carol Kane's a smoke show? No, it's not weird. I don't love it when most you use that think phrase. Of, but... Most people think of her as like like a slapsticky quirky. quirky. Yeah. But yeah. I think she's very pretty. I think she's very pretty. I just never... I know that they're doing it for comedic effect. And I guess they wanted each ghost to kind of have its own personality. Yes. But the thing is that in most other depictions of this, you have... You watch the character arc go from being very cynical to very slowly softening up, right? right? So the ghost of Christmas past came in and he was harsh at times, but he was also like Niagara Falls, Frankie. Yeah. Niagara Falls. And he got him to cry. And then we come to this and they're hitting each other like they're three stooges. Yeah. And I just never understood that. To me, it would make way more sense if that's the ghost of Christmas past that's the dynamic there. And mm-hmm. then and then you move from that to a less combative But she has some moments, too, where she's that way. Like when yeah, they, she does. Like when they go to Grace's house and he sees the boy, Grace, who's like the Tiny Tim character, mm-hmm. Grace's son, who doesn't talk, right? Yeah. And she's like, yeah, he, he saw his dad get killed and he hasn't, like, spoken since. Right. Right. So she has these moments where she's also being kind of sentimental. And but then it, it, I think it just breaks it up a little bit with the comedy. And like, you know, she hits him with a toaster at one point um, because each time she hits him, it like knocks him into a new scene. Yeah, that's true. It's just I just find it odd. And, and then he snuffs her out at the end. But um, it's also Carol. Ka- Carol Kane weighs like 95 pounds. Yeah. So there's humor in the fact that she's beating the crap out of him. And, a, and she's, like, way smaller and weaker than he So is. this is a, a fun fact that I saved. Apparently, this really was difficult for her because it's because it's such a physical part. Yeah. And she was, like, um, like she would, like, go and cry and try to, like, rest because it was so much. Well, because they had her in sm- wires and all sorts of and stuff. And also, you're smacking somebody over and over mm-hmm. and over. And he told her not to hold back. Yeah. And apparently she pulled his lip one time too hard and then he had to like recover for the rest of the day. Like they had, he couldn't like talk or anything. She hurt him a little bit too hard. But um, yeah, it, it is. The slapstick humor is funny, but we go through the present stuff. So we see James and he's at a party and he and his wife met Wendy, who's played by Wendy Malick, who's a great actress. She yep. was on Just Shoot Me. Yep. Um, and uh, I think hot in Cleveland and there and also his other brother, Joel, yep. who we yep. talked about is there too, um, his real life brother. So they're having a party and they're basically like playing charades and playing games and yep. like 20 questions. And, and, and a lot of the people start to like, even the wife starts to like kind of talk bad about Frank. Yeah. And you see that his, even though he treats James kind of like garbage, James mm-hmm. is always defending him. Yes. And then he's let. They're like, "Oh, well, we forgot to open your brother's gift to you." And he opens it, and it's a VCR. And he's yes. like, "That's not a hand towel." No, he's like, "My ex secretary got that yeah. for you." So then, um, the she covers his ears so he won't hear the gift that that James got for him. Yeah. Um, and then they move on, and we do see much more serious scene, less jovialness. Um, is that Grace, who we've seen kind of interspersed here and there, right? Yeah. Her son, Calvin, is basically mute. Right. Uh, selective mute. So he's he's d- not t- spoken since he saw his father yeah, die. Yeah, he's been traumatized. And she keeps taking him to doctors, but they can't figure it out. But Bill Murray watches him while her other kids, and I think maybe her sister, um... Like the whole family, right? right? All in this little apartment. And the kid figures out this game that nobody else could figure out. So he's very bright boy. He's just been traumatized, right? And it's kind of sad. And I thought this was interesting to have it be for the 80s instead of, you know, with Tiny Tim, it's kind of like implied tuberculosis and and possibly a, um, 
you know, physical impairment. Right. That it's like uh, an emotional handicap that can't mm-hmm. be, that they don't know how to fix. Right. So it's not like, well, he's a problem with his leg. Let's get him a prosthetic. Yeah. Right. So I thought that that was a cool update. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and then we uh, were coming back into. He's brought into the sewer where he finds Herman frozen. Yes. This is so. It's so sad. And he's first he thinks that that Herman's just kind of joking around. Um, But then his pocket watch falls down. Yeah. Right. And he can see um, the the um, the icicles on him. He's desperately trying to get out of there. And when he goes through the door, he ends up back in production. So the last bit of Christmas present really is finding Herman or yes. seeing Herman and it seems to somehow be like magically disconnected from being back on set. Right. But the ghost isn't with him for that. And I thought that was a good choice too, because it is a serious moment and having Carol Kane there would have distracted from yes. the emotional piece of it. Um and he basically is like, why didn't you just stay with Claire? But also why didn't you give him the three dollars he asked yeah. for? Yeah. Because maybe then he couldn't have afforded a cup of coffee or a sandwich or something, you know? Um, and it's that kind of thing that really shows the impact of his actions. Right. Right. Um, but he's back on set. Now, here's my other fun fact. The solid gold dancers are the screw jets. Yes. They have also a running gag where the sensor keeps getting injured, which I think is funny, especially if you know anything about the early days of Saturday Night Live, they had fights with the censors all the time Yeah, over what they could say at 1230 in the morning and what they couldn't. <laughs> um, so it's kind of mirroring that and the censor keeps getting smacked, but she wants the solid gold dancers to kind of cover up. Yes. Because you can see their lady parts yeah and um specifically their nipples yeah. <laughs> and he's like these guys are really looking they're really trying to see these nipples they don't see yeah. anything but this was the last appearance of the solid gold dancers oh uh, nice yeah they, they were like a smaller dance troupe in the 80s and, and solid gold was uh, off the air probably by this point got canceled yeah yep. so this was the last appearance in a tv or movie for the whole oh. group and he finds also in this time as he fo- jumps back into the stage and of the recording of the show mm. that bryce is directing now oh yeah and has taken over the whole situation yeah it seems like too much for you yeah i mean to be fair you are wandering around the city hallucinating and going to homeless shelters. Right. So there is a reason for it. Um, and then... So they send him upstairs to his office to relax. And then, well, just when we see a hand reaching out of the TVs to grab him, the hand of the Grim Reaper gro- Ghost of Christmas Future... Yeah. Elliot Loudermilk busts in. With a shotgun. Now, we have not mentioned that they've shown little vignettes, just like they've shown of Grace taking her son to, on the subway to yep. the doctor. They've also shown Elliot Loudermilk. He had... This the, poor bastard. The, the, his wife left him. His wife left took him. Took their daughter with her. Yep. He's uh, been trying to get drunk and keeps getting his booze either smashed, stolen. Yes. He's been... Like mud puddles thrown by up the by ghosts. Him by, yes. Yeah. The ghost of Christmas past stole his drink and yep. splashed a mud puddle in his face. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's at his last wit's end. Now, I will say, this is a scene that you can't have in a movie today. If they wanted no. to remake Scrooge with you somebody can't. busting with a 12 gauge shotgun, no. no. It's too realistic for the type of workplace violence we've seen over the past it, couple years. I feel years. like it kind of was then, too. I mean, you had postal incidents in the 80s. Yeah, you did. You know, where there was workplace violence. But I have to say, I think it's partially because Bobcat Goldthwait. Is not intimidating. Looking. No, and that's that's and the that's joke, the, that's right? the comedy behind that's it. That's the comedy. But he starts shooting up the office. Yeah, and Bill Bill Murray is was at the precipice of of kind of changing based on what he saw, and now uh, he's he's going through this. So he's got the ghost trying to get him on the one end, and Elliot Loudermilk trying to get him on the other end. Yeah, goes into the elevator. He thinks that it's the guy from the production. I really like how they did the Ghost of Christmas Future here because 
Ghost of Christmas Future usually is faceless, and here yeah. they have like a flickering TV. It's a TV screen, and yes. he sees himself reflected in, it, in yeah. it, which I thought was a super smart choice. Um, so they, the Ghost of Christmas Future, takes him, and the first thing we see is Grace with Calvin. Why is she dressed like that? Yeah, it's a. It's supposed to be in the future, so Calvin has been institutionalized. He's really like catatonic at this but point. But Grace, all of a sudden, is wearing like. Like a hijab, yeah, almost. And it's, and it's, I don't. They're trying to it's make it blue, and she's got like a linen dress on. But it it does look, it looks like, like she's wearing Islamic clothing. Yeah, which she's never been connected with. So that's I I asked why is she dressed Muslim, and like you had mentioned, well maybe they're just trying to make it look futuristic. But it was just a weird or, design yeah. choice, or possibly that she was of that religion but they cut that scene but i don't they know never had any yeah of that i don't know i think that they're just trying to do something different but they take her out of her like 80s power suits and also she's barefoot yeah but that's because she's in a padded cell with yep. him um and he just realizes that as the ghost of christmas present warned he could make the choice to retreat further and further into himself and that's what's happened Right. Yep. Then we see Claire. Who, Older and rich and cruel. And very pale. Yes, they chose that. to yeah. they, they whitened her up a little bit. Yeah. And she's like yelling at some kids who are on the street. She's like, I won't ever forget what my one time my friend said to me. If you want to save somebody, save yourself. Shake them off, Claire. Yeah. And, um, and he's like, oh my gosh, no, this isn't the Claire that I want. Like, I don't want Claire to become this. Yeah. My question, well, she thinks about him like in a loving way. And the assumption is like, maybe she's married somebody else. She's with ladies who lunch. Yeah. Right. So she's not working and she's certainly not helping homeless people anymore. Um, and so then we come to the death scene James and Wendy are the only two people there. Yeah, no one's at his funeral. The casket is going into the fire, and then all of a sudden he's in the casket. I also, again, I thought this was a really good update, as opposed to just seeing your gravestone, I think, is a lot. But it's not as shocking as being in no. the, the casket as you're going into the cremation. Yeah, the, the, original, the original version, I think he overhears people selling his stuff, if I'm not mistaken. That they're selling his bedclothes and they're like, it's the only warmth he ever had. Mm. Um, and the curtains and the, and the linens on his bed that um, nobody cared about him. They just took, you know, he collected stuff and he saved up money and when he was dead, that's all people, you know, then all that stuff was gone, right. basically. But um, I think it does show the fear that comes into him and the fear that comes to play. Because a lot of times before, you know, they'll say, like, before you have a huge transformation, you do have to kind of confront your demons, confront what you're doing now, and confront where you're going, Right. And confronting death in that way does, as they say, put the final nail in the coffin. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, that Charles Dickens kind of, they didn't know a lot about psychology back then, but they did. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then we have kind of the wake up redemption moment. Yep. Where he busts back out of the elevator and into Elliot Loudermilk's arms. Yes. And basically just disregards the fact that Elliot's trying to shoot him anymore. Yeah. And kind of makes up with Elliot and rehires him at twice as, three times his salary. Yeah, and what's hilarious is that it seems almost as if he, kind of like the audience... I, even having seen it before, I was like, oh, that's right. Elliot Loudermilk's still there with God waiting for him. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, it's funny in that way. And then they take over production. So he sends Elliot up to um, the booth. The booth. And Elliot tells the cameras not to cut and to stay on him and all that. And Elliot has them all at shotgun. Yeah, and he ties up Bryce. Gun, yeah, gunpoint. He ties up Bryce in a in a chair and uh, ties up the network sensor or has her at gunpoint as well. And then Bill Murray does the the final speech, yep. right? And um and says that you know he finally gets it and 
what kind of a bastard would would do this and make and they're like only you frank yeah what kind of bastard would make everyone work here tonight on christmas eve we also there's so much packed into this movie and i didn't want to go like line for line but what i also liked that th- that was really smart choices is that he would like meet the ghost of christmas past and then they would cut back to the live production and you'd see like buddy Epson as scrooge yeah um, who's a great character actor also, and wonderful cameo in this. And then he'd meet the ghost of Christmas Pat. Right. And then they'd show Calvin, and then they'd show, by the way, Mary Lou Retina's Tiny Tim. Yes. She doesn't just drop the crutches. She tosses the crutches, does a triple somersault, and goes and, back. And goes into the, the plant, yes. Yeah. All right. So he's... Uh, He's uh, having all these interspersed scenes back and forth, but now right. at the now at the end, he interrupts. Uh, Buddy as Scrooge is about to buy the turkey from the boy in the street, and then yeah. go on his little redemption uh, tour and apologize to everybody. And that's basically what Frank does. He apologizes to James. Talks about the importance of Christmas. He apologizes to Grace. Mm-hmm. And Claire um, shows up. Yep, says that he he kisses one of the solid gold dancers because she has mistletoe on her hat. And he's like, that was good, but it wasn't great. And he's like, there's only been one great, Claire. And Claire's like, hey, screw all these people on Christmas Eve at the homeless shelter. I'm running back over to him. I would not have done that. I've been like, that's good for you, but I go to find a new boyfriend. You seem like you got a lot going on right now. Okay. (laughs) Um, Also, you, you treated me horribly. But, uh, yeah, so he has the whole uh, speech, and then they sing a song. Yeah. And then we have this cool, which wasn't really done as much at the time, but we have, like, an after credits kind of scene, or during right. the credits, where he's, like, calling to the people in the theater. Yeah, where they, they engage the theater, the, the, the audience yeah, in the theater to the fourth, sing along with it. They break the fourth wall. Yep. So, um, so that's the movie. How did people feel about it at the time? So... Reception, as I mentioned before, first off, it had a thirty-two million dollar budget, right? Mm-hmm. It made a hundred million dollars. Oh, okay. So it was a success, money-wise, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which was good. You know, it made more than triple its its budget, which, as we've mentioned before, is always a a good thing, right? Um, Rotten Tomatoes nowadays gives the film a score of sixty-nine, which is not bad. Okay. It's a little low for what I would think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the pre-release audience, they did a pre-release of this movie in the summer of 88 before oh, it came out to kind of just, you know, get an early idea. And the pre-release audiences had 93% loved so it. So this is the thing I wonder about the 69%. You're talking also mm-hmm. about, like, people on there, like, Zoomers who might rate the movie. Like, they're not going to get any of the 80s jokes, like... Right. Even less than than I get them or that you know what I'm saying? Right. So if you have somebody who watches this at like fifteen, yeah. they're not gonna when find it. When it was released, funny. it had really the audience really loved it. Critics were a little split. Really? Yeah, Roger Ebert Roger Ebert called it one of the most disquieting, unsettling films to come along in quite some time. Roger Ebert's an idiot. And he said that it portrays pain and anger more than comedy. Yeah, but that's Scrooge. <laughs> right? I mean like that's the whole that's the whole thing. Right. It's pain and anger transformed by I mean there's not as much Jesus, but the spirit of Christmas. Right. Like that's yeah. The critic William Thomas called it a slick and cynical update of Dickens' tale, but that it is only funny when Murray's character is being a complete bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so when he's nice it's not funny anymore. Uh Washington Post said that it was a sprawling mess, but that they liked it. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and the and the Washington Post said that Scrooge was unlikely to become a seasonal tradition, like It's a Wonderful Life or Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. Well, they they <laughs> underestimated, I think, how much kids would like it. I think so too. Um, so yeah, so it was. Um, Los Angeles Times said the film's opening is its high point. <laughs> with Robert Goulet's Chris, Cajun Christmas, the night the reindeer died, and um. Father loves beaver. <laughs> yeah. Well, I so I will say I didn't ruin my childhood. It is a little bit different from what I remember. 
Um, I have watched it with you, but I haven't watched it in a while. I don't right. know when we, what, maybe when we were dating. We watched it, yeah, we watched it a couple years a couple ago. A couple years Christmas. ago. Um, but I think for me, I don't, I don't love the fact that, like I said, I think it's very odd that they're hitting each other, him and the ghost of Christmas present. present yeah. I also feel like, you know, maybe now Bill Murray's done some more serious stuff. Him doing this part where he's having the character transformation, it's still like, he's always Bill Murray to me. Right. Right. So... I don't know, and it's it's difficult, too, because the way that they decided to do this, he has a speech at the end, and he takes over the studio. Mm-hmm. But in the original version, in, in most adaptations, there's action. Right. He's he's giving somebody a raise and making them his partner. Yeah. He's, um, he's, he's taking care of... Tiny Tim, which, by the way, Calvin does say, God bless us, everyone. Right. I forgot to He's mention. He's bringing the turkey and, and all the and, presents, and, and yeah. And going to, to, to his nephew Fred's house and being part of their family and all of that. So, it's like telling versus showing, mm-hmm. right? And also, I don't, yeah, I, I just didn't see, like, the transformation as much, right? Mm-hmm. But again, I gotta say that partially that's because... You know, Alistair Sim did a did a version of this. Patrick Stewart's an amazing actor. He did a version. Yeah, there's been so many versions and, of and, Scrooge. And I have to say, again, my favorite version, besides Mickey's Christmas Carol, my favorite version is Michael Caine. And all of those are more serious. I mean, The yeah. Muppets has humor in it. But, mm-hmm. but all of those are really amazing actors. And you're doing a comedic version, and you're very funny, but you don't necessarily have at least at this point in his career the acting the dramatic acting ability to show some of that character arc right having said that what, i still love what the about movie. what about the ghosts of girlfriends past with matthew mcconaughey oh yeah he's got he's a Is great it that actor. your favorite no. christmas carol <laughs> adaptation no i don't hate it though okay <laughs> I don't really so hate it. so what do you give it i i'm gonna go with an eight I, I really still like it. I do think it's a funny movie. I think it. <laughs> I think in many ways, I think in many ways it it still holds up. I mean, a lot of the humor is eighties, but it's a classic story, and I think I think it it, it holds up even today. Yeah, I agree as well. I, I really like it. I think Christmas Carol. It's st- the story plot holds up. I think Bill Murray, Bill Murray did a good job, and we've talked about how many great actors he was surrounded with. I do love him and Karen so, Allen together. Yeah, so, so I'm going to give it, I'm giving it an eight as well. Okay, so we're actually on the same page we on are. this one. So. Yeah. Eight, eight ghosts out, out of ten. ten. Oh, my voice cracked weird. Mm. Eight out of ten ghosts for the movie. Two and a half ghost or two ghosts and a, and a Casper for the <laughs> for the snack of dots today. Um, this was our 49th episode. Yep. So the only thing left for this season is next week our 50th our 50th episode extravaganza. And it is going to be a good one. And um, we hope that you heard the announcement during the break. But if you didn't, we are now on Patreon. We're going to have some remixes of our episodes, the remix edition um, of a couple episodes during our break, during our little hiatus. So same episodes, but with a couple added bits in it for your entertainment and your enjoyment. And until then, we hope that you have a merry... (laughs) We hope that you have a merry Christmas. And a happy new year. I'm Megan. And I'm Steve. Take care, everybody.